Last week, we saw the successful landing of India's Chandrayaan-3 on the moon's surface. ISRO had earlier launched its Mars mission or Mangalyaan. It is now talking about its Sun mission or Aditya L1. It also wants to put an Indian on the moon. The space industry globally is getting to be worth billions of dollars. If you're new to the space, literally, pun unintended, if you're new to this area, a niggling question might be bothering you. Why invest in space? Why spend so much money in it? Why can't you put up a school, you know, spend on healthcare, education and so on? True, social welfare is important for all of us, but that does not mean we don't invest in the space industry. In the least, if it can spur our economy, then why not? If you want to know how, stay with me. Recently, the US's National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA as we all know it, commissioned a study to show how its work was helping the economy there. It said that in 2021, its work helped generate a total economic output of more than $71 billion, an increase of about 11% over 2019. It said that its work also supported close to 3.4 lakh jobs and resulted in almost $8 billion in total tax revenues. Note this, this is all in one year. Late last year, Harvard Business Review had an article that challenged the corporate world with a provocative headline asking companies, does your company have a space strategy? And it lays out benefits for those that do. What benefits, you might ask, if you've never used an app such as Swiggy or Zomato to order food, or an app like Ola or Uber to hail a cab, or never used Google Maps for you to get from one point to another, you might not know of the GPS or the global positioning system. The GPS is possible because of an array of satellites that are revolving around the Earth. They help track where you are at a certain point in time and track where you need to get to within a certain time, how long it would take, and also if there is traffic along the way. All this is possible because of the GPS. The authors of that HBR article point out that space technology can benefit sectors as diverse as agriculture and pharmaceuticals. How? It points out that experiments done in microgravity conditions or low gravity environment, such as in a spacecraft, have contributed to our understanding of fluid physics, the structures of gels and pastes, referred to as colloids, muscle atrophy and bone loss and combustion and much more, with applications for healthcare, manufacturing and several other industries. It says experiments in biology done in space have improved mankind's understanding about plant growth and germination in microgravity and their responses to light. In a communique released in March this year, pharma major Bristol Myers Squibb said it had resumed experiments in space to identify physical conditions that result in large, high-quality crystals in microgravity, which could lead to a better understanding of how to, one day, make some of its biologic medicines in crystal form. Medicines in crystalline form could offer greater stability and a more concentrated dosing strength. For patients, it could eventually mean quick at-home injections instead of lengthy and periodic infusions in a hospital. For companies, if the medicine does not require freezing or refrigeration and takes up lesser space for storage, it could offer significant savings for the supply chain and obviously lesser environmental impact. So much for what outer space can do to help us. But why go land on the moon or even Mars for that matter? One part of the answer is philosophical. Why climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. Likewise, I go to the moon because it's there. I want to know what's around me. The other is a more practical aspect. In 2008, the Chandrayaan-1 mission from India was a successful one. It helped prove what was inferred earlier, that there was ice on the moon, or at least some parts of the moon, the darkest and the coldest places on the moon. Why is this important? Because obviously we all know where there is water, or some form of water, there is always a possibility of life. In the least, if we find water, it could help further our understanding of what life forms are possible outside of Earth. And that's not all. If there is water or some form of water on the moon, it could one day serve as rocket fuel. We all know water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is a known fuel. People are talking about using hydrogen as fuel to run our cars on Earth. Oxygen is a necessary catalyst for combustion. So eventually, it could serve as rocket fuel, water in some form. Assuming that there is a certain required quantum of water available on the moon and that we can use it in such quantum, 
our natural satellite, the moon, could serve as an outpost or as my colleague and science writer in business line, M. Ramesh calls it, it could serve as a base camp for people going on their way to Mars. You stop over it on the moon, refuel and be on your way. Next, there are some rare minerals and metals that are to be found on the moon and likely other planets. A piece in the MIT Technology Review last year said that gold, platinum and some rare earth metals are to be found on the moon. Imagine if we were able to mine those and figure out a way to bring them all back to earth for our use. Of course, the cost of transportation ought to be far lesser than the cost of producing them here on earth. Then it would make sense. But beyond all of these, do you know what's the biggest takeaway that we could have from the moon? To know the answer, make sure you stay till the end and check out our Did You Know section at the end of this episode. Before we wind down this episode, let's take a look at what Chandrayaan-3, the latest successful mission by India to the moon, will do. Its primary objective was to land safely using this gadget, a device called the lander. Only three other countries have done this before, mind you. The US, Russia and China. India is the fourth. In addition, there are some scientific experiments that will be conducted by this mission by India, but one caught my eye. So one particular device that the lander helped safely land on the moon is called SHAPE or Spectropolarimetry of Habitable Planet Earth. It will be used to analyze light from Earth and the orientation of light waves from Earth. It is sort of like taking a fingerprint of Earth that can be checked against light from other planets. And if there is a match, it gives us hope that there could be life on these planets for us to go explore. And now coming to the did you know section of our episode, as promised earlier, we'll tell you what's the most valuable takeaway we could have from the moon. There are minerals and metals that we could mine on the moon, but as pointed out in a paper in 2022, put out by the USRA or the University's Space Research Association, a non-profit in the US, points out that helium-3 is the most precious thing we can take away from the moon because it's very rare on Earth and valuable to us, but very common on the moon. And why is it precious or valuable to us? Helium-3 is a gas that has the capacity to run nuclear fusion plants. Just think of this. One kg of helium-3 mixed with 0.67 kg of deuterium can produce enough power to run the United States for a whole year. The price of helium-3 could be even as much as $2,000 per liter here on Earth. That brings us to this week's quiz question. How long is one lunar day or one day on the moon? And here's the an answer to last week's question as well. The last week's question was, what is the link between hyperinflation and the fall of the Roman Empire? Here goes, the Roman Empire witnessed the use of the denarius as its currency. The denarius had 95% silver to begin with. In those days, the value of the currency was not a reflection on how good the economy was doing or what confidence the people had in what the government did or said. The value of the currency came from the value of the metals that was used to make the currency, in this case silver. But guess what, there wasn't enough silver to go around, there's only so much you could mine. And hence, there are only so many coins you could mint. So the number of coins in circulation was limited. But the governors of the Roman Empire wanted more and more money for their expenses, for their own luxury, for their wars, for their gladiatorial contests and so on. So they slowly started reducing the amount of silver that went into making these coins. So there came a point, maybe over three centuries, where the quantum of silver used in the denarius accounted for 5% and eventually only 0.5%. So it became almost entirely bronze-based coin. So with less and less silver in every coin, each coin could buy less and less because the value kept coming down. So they started minting more and more coins. So what happens when the supply of money increases in an economy? It gives rise to inflation, some rule of economics. Some historians guess that over a 100-year period, hyperinflation set in, inflation galloped some 15,000%. So obviously the gap between the rich and the poor kept widening. There was a point when some of the rich actually fled the Roman territories and wanted to set up fiefdoms of their own. The Roman Empire also wanted to keep expanding, but it did not have enough supply of people signing up as soldiers. So it started recruiting mercenaries who fought for the empire for a certain fee. But the mercenaries are mercenaries. So if the payments did not come on time because the economy was weak and there was hyperinflation, payments didn't come on time, the mercenaries turned on the empire itself. And this has happened a few times in the history. So even if inflation wasn't the sole cause 
the fall of the Roman Empire, it certainly exacerbated the other factors. That's all we have for now. If you're watching this on YouTube, do not forget to like, share and subscribe. And importantly, press on the bell icon. Till we meet again, have a lovely time ahead.